Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's and our worship this morning. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, I want to thank publicly Keith Pinson for standing in for me last week. That was uh, very nice. And I think I, I got a lot of good feedback. So I think you guys enjoyed him. So um, is it warm in here I, okay all right kind of maybe i can always speak up we can turn the air on and i can always speak up maybe just a little bit yeah okay um all right while i give the announcements here uh the flowers this morning given to the glory of god in loving memory of bob and garth plosky and honor of kendra plosky from susie burkhart and family and uh, the prayer meeting, we have a, we've been starting a prayer meeting on Sunday evenings. Uh, we had one in June and we're going to have another here in July. It's not the 28th, it's the 21st and it will be at 6 p.m. So make a note there, there's a little bit of an error in the bulletin. We'll make that correction. And then we are planning a luncheon for August 18th. So please mark your calendars for that. Um, again, the uh, announcements here as you see them, events this week. I don't know if there's anything. We, we are having Bible study via Zoom and we're gonna talk about wisdom. So we just completed first, second Chronicles and uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of a thing on wisdom and then uh, we'll see where it goes from there. But we thank Phil for his efforts in going through the Old Testament from Genesis all the way up, right, to Second Chronicles. We haven't, uh, yeah, oh, Joshua, yeah. Yes, so we thank you for that. And uh, let's see, the church office, oh, should note this, Valerie is on vacation 
uh, this week, so the church office will be closed, but I'll still be answering my phone, so if you want to talk or whatever, <laughs> give me a call. Um, all right, so with that, uh, let's move then to our call to worship. So our call to worship this morning is Psalm 2. And uh, Psalm 2, it's thought that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 go together and open the Psalter itself. Psalm 1 being that of the law of the Lord, and then Psalm 2 bringing up the Messiah. So this whole Psalter opens with the word of God, the law of the Lord, and then his Messiah. So we're reading here in Psalm 2 about the Messiah, and we see how the nations rage and so forth. But let this call us to worship, and what we're focusing on today is the majesty of Christ uh, in our Matthew passage. Uh, I'm going to describe it that way. We'll talk more about it. But um, so I want you to hear this from Psalm 2, uh, just the majesty of the Messiah. And then we'll also read from Hebrews 1. So really, you know, Matthew has been talking about teaching with authority. Now he's talking about Jesus' acts with authority, really giving us a Christology of his own. But we'll hear this call to worship from Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's Psalm 2. So let's pray. Let's ask for the Lord's presence. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, and we come now today as your people to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit, to open our hearts and minds to greater ways to behold your majesty. We ask this to the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So our opening hymn, and this is uh, interesting. I, <laughs> I like the little uh, story that Shelley related this morning with Mia asking about the call to worship and what is that well it is truly our opening hymn oh worship the king so let's stand and sing these words oh worship the king
Thank you. Okay, so we have a New Testament reading. Usually I pair our Matthew reading with an Old Testament, but I thought today I'd pair it with a New Testament that actually quotes a lot of the Old Testament. <laughs> so I found all the quotes I wanted in Hebrews 1. The book of Hebrews is, again, another Christology, really a high Christology, focusing on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, Hebrews 1, again, declares to us the majesty of Christ, how he is above the angels, above Moses, above the priesthood, all of these things. Hear God's word now from Hebrews chapter 1. God after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better the, than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. And when again, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, O Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all, I'm sorry, they all will become old like a garment. And like a mantle, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Here ends the reading of God's word. We come now to our time of prayer. It is a prayer of forgiveness and the seeking of assurance of pardon. It is also intercessory. And so we will pray for those on our hearts and minds this morning. We have a list on the back of your bulletin as well. And we want to uphold one another in prayer and so our practice is that I give you a moment to pray silently. I'll then lead us in prayer. And uh, we're celebrating the supper today, so we'll not close with the Lord's Prayer. We'll do that after the supper. But let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for who you are. As the Holy One of Israel, high and lofty, and yet you dwell in the hearts of your people. That through Jesus Christ, we may find forgiveness of sin. We may find relationship with you to come into your presence, to call upon your name 
and to have you hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the forgiveness of our sin, which is great and many in your sight. We have read, Lord, how you have saved, how you have rescued, how you have healed. That in Jesus Christ, we may find that healing. We may find that forgiveness. And all that we need in order to live according to your word. Father, we pray for that forgiveness. We pray for that healing. That you turn our hearts again anew, refreshed in your grace and in your love, in your care, that we might serve you with joyfulness and gladness, that we might rejoice to read your word and to find in there the fullness of joy, even in the midst of suffering and pain. So, Father, we pray not only for the forgiveness of our sin, but we pray also to know that we are your people and you are our God. That is the covenant faithfulness that you have demonstrated in Jesus Christ, giving him a ransom for many, and that through him we come and are not lost, that he is always with us and that nothing can take us from him. That is the assurance that we are yours and you are ours. Father, we pray for that. We know there are times when we don't always feel that. But we pray, knowing these words, your words of promise, your words of faithfulness, we pray for the reassurance of your spirit to lead us and to teach us that we are your people. And we thank you for that. And Father, as we come, we do pray for those who are in need today, those who are in need of healing, comfort, those who grieve the loss of loved ones. And Father, we think of the shooting yesterday, and we ask that your hand of healing would be upon those who were affected, your hand of comfort for those who grieve. We commit them to your merciful hands that in all of this they would look to you, the sovereign God, who is over all things, who orchestrates all things for your goodness and to the glory of Jesus Christ. We pray for them. We pray for ourselves in like manner as we struggle with afflictions in life, with difficulties, difficult decisions, bad decisions, bad habits, all of these things. Father, we pray that you lead us out of and into your presence through Jesus Christ. We pray for Sherry and healing. We pray for June and healing that you would give him comfort, give him strength. We pray for Jack and Ailita and the struggles they're having this morning. We pray, continue to pray for Joe and Linda and the healing of Linda's body and mind. And we ask that you continue to sustain them in your love and care. We thank you that uh, Janet's head is healing and we pray, continue to pray for Ron and his family as they grieve the loss of Elaine. We pray for Marvin and Marilyn. We lift up Tony. We pray for Earl and Shirley. And we thank you uh, that they continue to get along okay. We miss them here, but we pray for them as they have opportunity to see the service online 
and to read your word and that we can visit with them. We thank you for those who have reached out to them. We continue to pray for Barb and her family and the struggles she continuously faces with her legs. We pray for Susie. We thank you for her commitment to you and her love that is demonstrated even in the giving of flowers. Father, we pray for Kathy and Rosemary. We pray for Iris and her family. We pray for Mary. We pray for Roy and Janice, Forrest and Elijah. We also think of those who are doing missionary work. We think of Gwen and others. We lift them up to your care. We pray for their provisions. We pray for our governing authorities. Lord, that you would work in their hearts, those you have established over us, that they would seek your face, that they would uphold your principles and your institutions as you have established in your word. We thank you for the ministry you have given us here at St. Paul's. We pray for that as we continue to reach out to our community. We pray for the congregations, likewise in our community, who seek to uphold the name of Christ in all of its fullness. Father, we pray for them. We pray for growth and wisdom and in love and in number, that we might see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we thank you for these things and we pray all of this to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our praise hymn is number 258, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, words of Isaac Watts. Let's sing.
Okay, it's time for the young people's message. All right, young people, let's talk about heaven and earth. We're talking about heaven and earth. We've said before, and maybe you recall, that these are God's two good realms of creation, heaven and earth. Heaven is where God is. Earth is where we are, right? These two places, if you recall, overlapped for a time in the beginning. In the garden, we had heaven and earth overlapping, right? God was walking in the garden with Adam. So these two places overlapped for a time, but then something happened that separated them, brought a separation. Man sinned, and that sin, the result of that, separated heaven and earth. In the Old Testament of the Bible, God met with his people in what's called the temple, and the temple was kind of an intersection between heaven and earth. And it really pointed to a time when these two realms of God's creation would come together again, heaven and earth. The Bible also mentions, though, that in God's realm, that is heaven, the heavenly realm, there are creatures we call angels. And there are good angels, and there are bad angels, evil angels, and sometimes we call them demons. The angels, both good and bad, have God's permission at times to go between heaven and earth, to interact with our world. And we see this in a number of ways, right? We saw this even with Satan in the garden. And also with the announcement of John the Baptist's birth, remember Zechariah in the temple? And then also with Jesus' birth, with Mary. And so, here in our text today, um, our text today relates an event about the influence of bad angels, of demons. We're going to talk about those. And they come and they confront Jesus. So I want you to listen to the text this morning and the message, and let me know afterwards, what do we learn about Jesus' relationship to demons? What do we learn about Jesus' relationship to the demons, to the bad angels? Do they like him, not like him? How do they respond to him? So I want you to think about that uh, as you hear the text and listen to the message. And then what would be the treat? Well, of course, the treat is going to be a clue here. The treat, you know, it's a clue, and Jesus' authority really extends over both God's good realms, heaven and earth. Jesus' authority is over both of those, heaven and earth. So we're talking about heaven and earth. And we may have just done this one recently, but I like to repeat. So this is the good chocolate and peanut butter realms of God's good creation. Reese's cups. Okay, all right. So that's the treat. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege it is to speak to these young hearts and young minds. And we pray for them. We continue to pray for them. Lift them up as they study your word and come to grips with your creation, understanding the reality in which they find themselves through your word and how these things interact together, the good, the bad, and how it all comes together and how you are over all of it. Teach them that, we pray. And we pray it not only for them, but for each one of us. And we ask it to the glory of your King, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so let's turn in our Bibles to chapter 8 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 8, and we're looking at verses 28 to 34 this morning. Just a short passage. 28 to 34 of Matthew chapter 8. I'm reading from the New American Standard, so it may be slightly different in your translation. Uh, but we're going to talk about some of these words. Uh, nevertheless, if you have questions or concerns, you can ask me after, or you can save it for next Sunday in the 
morning Bible study. We have a pretty good time talking about these things. So, uh, all right, let's read Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 to 34. When Jesus came, I'm sorry, <laughs> I've messed up already. When he came, that is Jesus, he came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes. Two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And they cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. The demons began to entreat him, saying, If you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. And they came out and went into the swine, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. The herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. Here ends the reading of God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the time we have to open and read your word. We pray now that your spirit lead us in its truth. Cause our hearts and minds to grow. For we ask to the glory of Christ. Amen. Change for the better is not always welcomed. The truth is not always embraced or even celebrated. As we look at our passage this morning, the one thing I want you to take away is this. In his interaction with the demons, Matthew reveals Jesus' authority over the unseen world. The response isn't always positive. But in his interaction with demons, Jesus' authority over the unseen world is revealed and the response isn't always positive. So let's open with our context. I always like to start with context. So important. Matthew's Gospel. We're in Matthew's Gospel, obviously. It is a Gospel of fulfillment. Matthew has that phrase of Fulfilling the scriptures, he has told us that from the beginning and he, and he works through his gospel this way. Uh, he has presented Jesus to us as the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. And we have seen with the sermon, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, that first large teaching section in Matthew, that Jesus is teaching with authority. That's how it ends. They recognize that he is teaching with authority. And then we move, Matthew moves us into these demonstrations or acts of authority. But we do want to point out in chapter 4, Matthew did summarize for us Jesus' Galilean ministry. How everything was going great. Healing all kinds of sickness, disease, pain. And even the demonized, or those under the influence of demons, were told that in chapter 4. Just a summary of it. And then after the teaching with authority, we find Jesus healing the leper with a touch. The centurion's servant with a word. And then Peter's mother-in-law again with a touch. And we're told how this fulfills Isaiah 53, verse 4. His authority uh, is connected to his carrying of our illnesses and our diseases. 
Last week we read about the cost of discipleship. We saw how uh, the scribe interacted and then another disciple. We were told about uh, the fact that there's no rest, so it's a high cost of discipleship. And then there's also priorities. So we're told about these things, and last week, we uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying last week, I meant last time I was with you, not with Keith. Um, so the last time we read about his power, we concluded with the power of Jesus over nature itself, how he commanded uh, the winds and the sea. And the disciples we left off with the question, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? And this is where we pick up with the narrative today. It says, and when he came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, there are a number of questions here as we start to look at the text. I'm going to take the text a couple verses or a verse at a time and we look at this. Uh, there are a couple questions right from the start. We see that Jesus is looking to escape the crowds. Right, he's looking to escape the crowds. The crowds are coming to him. He's been healing and doing all this great stuff. And the crowds have come. And he calls his disciples into a boat to go to the other side. And when he came to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men were told confront him as they're coming out of the tombs. So looking to escape the crowd, Jesus and his disciples reach the other side. And uh, some commentators point out the differences between Matthew and Mark and Luke. The place where, where this is taking place, whether it's the Gadarenes or Gerasenes. Is it Gadara? Is it Gersa? What town is this actually taking place in? But we're not told a specific place. We're told... It is the country of, or the region of. <clears throat> so we have to be careful as to draw out any kind of contradiction between the Gospels. One could be referring to one city and another, another, but they're in the same region, so forth. So we want to note that. Um, the other thing is that there are two men with Matthew and only one uh, with Mark. So Matthew reports two men rather than one. Is it, is it a different occasion? Is it theological in terms of witnesses? Uh, two witnesses, you know, the Bible talks about having two witnesses. Is this what Matthew's doing? It's very difficult to say. Um, or could there have been actually two, and Mark only focuses on one? So there's a number of different reasons we can point out as to why Matthew has two or Mark has one. Maybe none of them satisfy you, but there are different answers for that. Uh, nevertheless, it can be explained. So looking for um, rest from the crowds, Jesus has gone to the other side. We know the incident in the boat uh, as he traveled over to the other side and the question we're left with, seeking that rest. Here they finally get to the other side and what happens? Well, he's confronted by these two men uh, that are in the New American Standard that I read, it says demon-possessed, and perhaps it says demon-possessed in your translation as well, but the same word is used as I concluded the passage in uh, the New American Standard, where it says, you know, the herdsmen ran away, they reported everything, including what happened to the demoniacs. That's actually a closer a uh, better translation of that same Greek word. In other words, um, as uh, the, the Greek word, if you're not familiar with it, I'll just pronounce it daimonizomai, daimonizomai. That's the Greek word for that, but we translate it in many of the translations have demon possessed, but per perhaps a better translation would be demonized or under the influence of a demon. Uh, Wayne Grudem notes that the New Testament Greek never uses the language that people are possessed. Use that word possessed. Uh, that's not in the Greek. As I said, there's just one word here that's being translated. That's daimonizomai. And so however you want to translate it, they are under the influence of demons. And so 
the scriptures here, New Testament especially, speak of various degrees of that demonic influence. Demons are fallen angels who follow Satan, the devil, who is the chief of the fallen angels. And they are creatures. I want to remind you, these are creatures having set themselves against God, their creator, and they cannot escape his power or authority over them. Okay, so there are various levels or stages of demonic activity throughout redemptive history, but not much is said in the Old Testament with respect to exorcisms, to casting out demons. There is one passage that is interesting, and maybe you recall it, but do you remember when David would play the harp for Saul? You see, Saul would be vexed, and it was said that David would play the harp and the demons would leave Saul alone. <laughs> So there is that kind of uh, interesting perspective there in 1 Samuel 16, 23, as David played the harp. It seems, though, to reach this demonic kind of influence seems to reach a climax, though, in the New Testament with the coming of the Messiah. And rightly so. Uh, I'm just thinking when I say rightly so that it is part of God's rule or kingship breaking into the world of darkness. And that raises this activity. The scriptures clearly teach that Satan and all the fallen angels can do only what God permits. We see this most clearly in the book of Job, don't we? Satan asks uh, to test Job and God permits. But there's not much focus on Satan in that whole event. In fact, we only hear in the first chapters. The rest of it is left to go. So, um, the other thing is, as we look at this, here are these uh, de demoniacs or demon-influenced men who come out of the tombs. Everything about this passage speaks to us uh, about the uncleanness of the situation. They are in Gentile territory. They're in the tombs <laughs> where the dead are buried. And out come the, these two men under, significantly under the influence of uh, the demons, so much so that no one passes that way because of the violence that is taking place because of them. Extremely violent. Violence, chaos are all characteristics of evil and demonic activity. So, that's the setting we come to. Jesus is not going to find rest here, although he was seeking it from the crowds. He is not going to find it. The two men confront him. And what we see here now is a conversation that takes place between Jesus and these two men. And it's not so much the men who are speaking, but the demons speaking through them. So, in verse 29, and they cried out, saying, What business do you have with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? There's a couple interesting things here in this verse. Jesus' disciples just asked the question, What kind of man is this that the winds and the sea obey him? And perhaps it is Matthew placing that question in the mouths of the disciples that he wants his readers to be asking as well. And here we have the demons recognizing Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God, the Messiah, the Son of Psalm 2. So now we have the demons. The conversation seems to be between Jesus and the demons speaking through the ten, the two men, recognizing Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus had earlier referred to himself as the Son of Man. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, but here the demons recognize him as Son of God. Of course, Satan tested the loyalty of Jesus' sonship back in chapter 4 in the wilderness, but here, one of the most interesting phrases we, we find is, have you come here to torment us before the time? This is what the demons are asking. But where is here? Have you come here? Where is here 
that they're talking about? Is it the territory that they've come to in the Decapolis, this Gentile territory? That's one question. D.A. Carson notes that demonic activity wasn't simply limited to the Gentile territories. So what are they talking about here? Have you come here? Could it be more in line with earth that you have come, son of God, to earth, to this realm, to where we are able to trouble uh, the human beings? Have you come here to earth? to torment us before the time. Well, what is before the time? What does that suggest? Well, I think it suggests that the demons have a limited time period for their activity. Jesus' coming now signals the beginning of the end of their activity. Have you come here to torment us before the time? But it also suggests a couple other things. The messianic role is to judge the world in righteousness, including and condemning the fallen angels. This is the idea. Have you come here to torment us before the time? There is an appointed time. This is what we may be getting a glimpse of. Just like um, you have a dark room and you flip the light on and you see it and the light flips off again, you get a flash of what's going on in the room. Here is a picture, a flash of the messianic role from an eschatological perspective, from an unseen world perspective. Have you come here to torment us before the time? We'll see more on this topic as... Uh, we go through Matthew's gospel. But this is just a glimpse. And then we come to verses 30 and 31. Now there was a herd of many pigs feeding at a distance from them. Uh, of course, the pigs too, right, suggest, and I think when I read from the New American, it said swine, pigs, swine. But that also suggests this is not a Jewish place. This would not be a Jewish place. These are Gentiles, and they have pigs, a herd of swine, and they're feeding at a distance from them. And the demons then, now we're told the demons, begged, implored. What was the uh, word I used earlier? What does your text have perhaps? But it says here, the demons began to entreat him. But the word is begged, implore. They begged him, saying, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of pigs. The herd of many pigs, again, as I said, speaks to the Gentile area. The demons begged. The demons recognized Jesus' authority. They recognize the Son of God and his authority over them. So here is a picture Matthew is presenting. We had not only Jesus' authority over disease and illness and pain, so much that he could touch a leper, he could speak for the centurion's servant to be healed from a distance and touch Peter's mother-in-law. Then we see him command nature, the winds and the sea obey him, now we take it to another level where Jesus' authority is demonstrated over the unseen world. This is not only authority in, in earth, but also in heaven. Over the spirits. The demons begged him. If you're going to cast us out, send us into the per herd of pigs. Why? They recognize that they are at his will. And why do they want to be sent into the herd of pigs? Is it that the demons do not like to be without a home? Could that be it? Is it just another way of wreaking havoc? Whether it is on God's animals, or whether it is bringing a bad reputation to Jesus by destroying the economic value of this Gentile area with the herd? And Jesus said to them, 
There's no incantation here in terms of exorcism. Jesus simply says, go. And they came out and they went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. Jesus gives a one word response. Go or depart. That's it. And the demons go. They obey. And the whole herd, now this is odd. If you're thinking, well, maybe they wanted to go into another home and they go into the pigs and then what do they do? <laughs> Drive the pigs down the, the bank into the sea to kill them and now they're left without a home again. It's kind of odd to think that that was their purpose. But the pigs die, not the demons. Although one commentator tries to make a case for the, the, the fact that the pigs go into the sea and drown, but this is Jesus' way of also condemning the spirits to their eternal home. Uh, nothing in the text really says that. I think that's uh, not there. But the, just that the herd, the drowning is reference to the herd dying. We don't know where the spirit, spiritual beings, these demons, go. But what was the purpose of that? Is it simply, could it simply be the visible proof of casting out these demons? Going from these two under the influence of the demoniac to the pigs. And that's visible. So that the people could see his authority over the unseen world. Pigs are at a distance. The pigs rush down, not because of the demoniacs, any kind of problem with them, but they're at a distance. So, you know, what drives them into the sea? I think this is what is being said. Matthew is drawing this out. In verse 33, then, and the herdsmen ran away. The herdsmen ran away, went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men or the demoniacs or the men under the influence of these demons. They reported everything to the city. So they tell the city what took place, not just about losing the herd, but also the men. Was there noticeable change in the men? Could that have been there? Could that have been part of the story? We're not told. What is the response of the city? With Jesus, there is always a response. It may not always be recorded for us. What is the response of the men? Well, we're not told. We are told in Mark, if it is the same uh, account, we are told what happened to the one man. We're not told here, but we are told about the city. Behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And if you stop there, you'd be saying, oh, we know why they're coming out to meet Jesus. This is great. He has power over the demons. But we don't stop there. It says, when they saw him, they pleaded, they begged, they implored, they entreated with him to leave their region. The whole city came out to meet him. And that same word that is used of the demons when they say, when they beg Jesus, let us go into the pigs, the same word, Greek words used here. The city begs for him to leave. Although the light had come into the world, the men loved the darkness. Why is it that they beg him to leave? We'll talk about that in the study. I can only speculate. A few points of application will move to the supper. Following Jesus' teaching with authority, Matthew places actions of authority. Healing disease, calling for discipleship, commanding the wind and sea, and now demonstrating his authority over the unseen world 
of the fallen angels. Spiritual forces, says Paul, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Coming face to face with Jesus results in change. There is no middle ground. He is unique in that way. You either beg him to stay, follow him, or you beg him to leave and run away from him. Jesus escaped the crowds of Galilee only to be asked to leave by the city in Decapolis. Jesus is no ordinary man. And this prepares us, I think, perhaps for what is to come when we get to Jerusalem. When there will be those who say, Hosanna, and there will be those who say, Crucify Him. On His side, though, when you're on the side of Christ, there is no safer place in the world. His power and authority guarantee nothing can take you from Him. He brings you into the fullness of joy. In His interaction with the demons, Jesus' authority over the unseen world is revealed. And the response isn't always positive. So let's celebrate now the meal that Jesus gave us. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and the words of institution. You can follow along there. But this meal is an invitation for all who call upon the name of Christ, who follow Him, baptized. This meal is for you. And it is a picture of what Jesus accomplished in bringing His people together in an organic way by dying for them on the cross. And this meal is primarily a memorial. We do this in remembrance of Him. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which He was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray, and then we'll distribute the bread. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you <coughs> for all that you give to us. We thank you for this meal. We thank you for what you have done to accomplish salvation in Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray now as we celebrate that you would set apart from a common to a sacred use in as much as to be used these elements of bread and cup to the glory of Jesus Christ. For we pray in his name. Amen. Let's distribute the bread.
his body which is for you, take and eat. In the same way he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's distribute the cup. The cup of the new covenant in his blood, take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread <clears throat> and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's close with the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let's stand and sing. That's number 118.
we don't get to do that one very often. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Uh, people of God, receive the blessing that comes from our God. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the ever-abiding presence of His Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. That concludes the service. Thanks for joining us. Have a blessed week.